Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Chula good morning. Vista Presbyterian, daybreak of Chula Vista Presbyterian Church. Um, what a joy to be back with you during this Christmas tide. You can still see we got Christmas going on. It's our fourth day of Christmas, fifth day of Christmas today. Um, and an early Happy New Year to you. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to be so bold to guess to say that I know what all of you are thinking, but I kind of have an idea. I'm gonna, I think it's about a specific thing. So I'm not, of course, I'm not a mind reader, but I'm just experienced. So um, it's something that people in, who encounter me often wonder about. They have this question, and um, I'm guessing that m some of you wanna know about my name. <laughs> Where's my name from? Um, so does anyone remember the Fairlight, the keyboard from the 1980s? Any musicians out there? Right. Well, I am musical, but I'm not that young. <laughs> so, uh, I was born, I know it's hard to believe, um, I was born after that, before that rather, so thank you. Uh, some of you might be thinking, well, I know. Her parents were hippies right <laughs> of course they named her Fairlight. she's born in the 70s um true they were hippies they were hippies they did probably trip on some things but that's not where my name comes from so my mother is an english literature teacher and um she loved the book christy by katherine marshall some of you might know this book. Um, Catherine Marshall wrote the book about her grandmother who was a Presbyterian missionary from Ardmore, Pennsylvania. And she went to the Appalachian Mountains in Tennessee. And there were many, many Scottish settlers. And even though it was the 1920s, it felt very 1860s there. There were no telephones yet. Uh, a lot of families were feuding. And so Fairlight, was one of the settlers there from Scotland and she had a husband and she had five children she made quilts she got scarlet fever and died so not my fate do not ask me to be in the quilting ministry <laughs> um, but she's a beautiful character and she's one of Christie's best friends in the book so I am honored to be named after her apparently there is a fair light Facebook um, w other women who are named this. I have yet to meet another Fairlight. I'm not quite sure what I would do if I did, <laughs> but I think there's another one even living here in San Diego. Um, it was also, Christy was also a miniseries in the 90s, and Tess Harper played Fairlight. So maybe one day I'll meet another one, but for now, um, that's where my name comes from. So we got that out of the way. Okay, that greeting line is going to go much faster. Speaking of which, I might be wearing my husband's gloves. I've been feeling a little under the weather after Christmas. I guess it, some other folks are sick too. It's like that post-Christmas stress. Okay, here comes the cold. <clears throat> so, um, I'm gonna get ready to read the Bible now. All right, it's not on the screen, right? It doesn't go on the screen? It will? Okay, then I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different. I know sometimes people like to read along in their Bible. They like to read along on the screen. Um, but if you would, this time, just listen. So if you wouldn't mind, Abby, um, if you can just make that projector or leave it up as the Star Trek piece, that'd be great. Because the Bible is a story. It's a story of us. It's the story of God. It's the story of God's rescue plan for us. So I'm just going to retell a little piece of that story. And we're going to read this together. And we're going to see what that piece of that story might be saying to us today. So I want you to listen to the story of God found this first Sunday of Christmas tide 
in the gospel according to Matthew, the second chapter. So let's listen to God's word together. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem, and they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star, and when it rose, and, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly, and he found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and, and as soon as you find him, uh, report to me, so that I may, too, so that I can go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, our text today, it gives us an account in the New Testament of when some magi, some foreigners, some outsiders were on a star trek. <laughs> who were going boldly where no one has gone before. These magi, these Trekkies, if you will, were drawn by the glory of a star to meet Jesus, Jesus Christ the King, and to experience him in such a way that their lives were changed and so that the world would know who the true King was. Amen? But not everybody was excited to meet this King. Certainly not King Herod the Great. And yeah, he wanted to meet him, but not for the same reasons, right? And later in this chapter, ooh, mm, he goes to great lengths to never meet him, in fact. Our text today, which many of you think you are familiar with, <laughs> uh, which many of you know you see annually, hear about annually in our nativity. I think our nativities out there, the don't touch, just look one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's going to show us three things today about how wide and how deep God's mercy is. So we're going to look today at the star, the prophecy and the child. The star, the prophecy, and the child. So let's go, let's think about what we know, we think we know about the Magi. How many wise men were there? Three. Okay. And they weren't just wise men, right? We have relabeled them as kings, right? We three kings, right? <laughs> okay. And there were three, right? Because there were three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That's right. And we sing the song, we three kings of Orient are good, right? Well, let's look. Let's listen again. Our text never calls them kings and never says that there were three <laughs> and certainly doesn't put them at 
the stable, if we think about our nativity, doesn't put him at the stable with the sheep and the ox and the shepherds. In fact, it's several months after Jesus' birth that these folks, however many, we don't know, however many arrive, and they're probably in a house by now. Because very shortly, in the very next verse, Joseph's going to get that dream that he's got to flee Bethlehem and go to Egypt, right? Because they're on the run, persecuted, seeking refuge, <laughs> asylum, right? <laughs> and we do know this. They are magi. Magi. And, and that's what Matthew the most Jewish of all the gospel writers, that's what Matthew chooses to call them. And it only this story only appears in, in Matthew. It's not in the other gospels. Luke's got the shepherds. <laughs> that's his story. And Matthew's got the magi. And now we say wise men, or we say kings, but Matthew just simply calls them magi. And so magi are, you, you kind of chimed in, yeah, astrologers. They're, they're magicians. They're interpreters of dreams, of signs, of all these strange happenings. They're a lot like fortune tellers, and they were skilled in divination. They were astrologers and astronomers because Astrom astronomy, right? That's the law of the stars, the when and the how. And astrology is the meaning of the stars. Now, back then, that was combined. We didn't, they didn't separate those two things. We, we do today, the difference between astronomy and astrology. But back then, it was, oh, I understand. I see the stars. Now I'm going to interpret them. Nevertheless, the Magi were not Jewish. They weren't even faith-based people. They didn't follow Yahweh, and they were most likely Persian. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Greek translation from the Old Testament was more like they were a, the prophet's enemies. Mm -hmm. These were the folks that Daniel went up against. They were the opposite of the spirit-filled prophets in the Old Testament, and Matthew's hearers would certainly be wondering, what the heck? A bunch of non-believers are coming to worship the king of the Jews? What? They were seen as idolaters, really. And they taught others to look at anything but the true God, the Lord, Yahweh, and, and certainly not the Torah. Matthew here is showing the church that it's okay to be critical of this new age type thinking, but to still have a heart for this new age type people. Matthew is also the gospel writer who puts those four unusual women in the genealogy of Jesus, you might remember. He's the one showing the church the wideness of God's mercy and love. It's for all the world. And so, a far out and a far off crowd come to visit, check in on, honor, maybe you need, let's hear it. No, they came to worship the king of the Jews. Not just out of curiosity, ooh, who's that star pointing to? They remembered the prophecy, we saw the star and we came to worship him. And note, this is the only time the Magi speak in Matthew. The only time they speak when they say, we came to worship him. It only increases the mystery around them, doesn't it? But it also allows for their actions to follow their confession. Now about this star, well, ancients believed that when something big was happening on earth, it was reflected in the heavens. Heaven and earth were interconnected and vice versa. A remarkable event among the stars and planets must mean a remarkable event on earth. For example, there was a supernova when Julius Caesar was born, connecting heaven and earth. Thus the Magi took off from their land now, it was most likely, 
if we want to talk about what was happening in the stars, it was most likely the phenomenon when Jupiter and Saturn were in conjunction with another, and it happened three times that year, what we believe to be 7 BC. To Magi, Jupiter was known as the royal or kingly planet. And Saturn was sometimes thought to represent the Jewish people. So those astronomers, astrologers, you remember, at that time would interpret this to mean a new king of the Jews was going to be born. And they also seemed to be wealthy enough to make that journey, didn't they? Wealthy enough to go find out for themselves what was going on. Something, someone big was about to happen. And they weren't sure exactly what or where this king was. And they did know that the king of the Jews currently lived in Jerusalem. So they went to ask because they needed more information. So what's that information that they looked for? Well, they want to know, where exactly is he? <laughs> where, can, where can this new king be found? Well, only in the word of God, the scripture, the one that they aren't exactly familiar with. The Magi and the king are interested in knowing where he is. So they turn to the chief priest, right? And the teachers of the law, the ones who would know about this prophecy. The learned ones, right? The believers. Tell us, where, where can he be found? Bethlehem. Oh, great, great. Well, then it's off to Bethlehem. We will go. But before they do, Herod and some others react in a very curious way, right? You see, this prophecy, while it's good news to the outsiders, to the magi, to the foreigners, it seems to be a bit of bad news <laughs> for Herod. And for, it says in our scripture, all of Jerusalem. Why? Why is all of Jerusalem, uh, you might remember the translation said disturbed, right? <laughs> Why were they disturbed by this? Well, if you haven't figured out yet, when Herod says, oh yeah, bring the child to me so that I can worship him, wink, wink, <laughs> right? Uh, um, he's lying. He has no interest in worshiping this new, new king because he is king. And this is the king who, in, later in the chapter, will have all the boys under the age of two murdered. And I know my, where's my child? Yeah, he's in the bathroom. So, so we, we've, been, we've talked about that this week. I mean, his eyes are real big, going, what? What? Yeah. It's crazy, right? It doesn't sound... Uh, like Herod's on his rocker. <laughs> he's off his rocker, as a matter of fact. But he's going to have all the boys under the age of two murdered because they threaten his throne. This is also the same king, friends, who he killed three of his own children because they posed a threat. In fact, Caesar said of Herod the Great that it was better to be his pig than his child, than his son, actually, right? I mean, maybe today we might look at Herod and say, wow, he was a psychopath. R truly, right? That might be his diagnosis at that point. So Jerusalem was scared too because a threat to this king, it meant bad news for them too. It, he, he, this person would take out his frustration, his disturbedness, on the people around him, on his own people. And so the threat to Herod meant a threat to the welfare of God's people too. And so here we find outsiders seeking to find and worship the Messiah of Israel, while insiders of the faith, well, they want to seek him out too, but not for the same reasons. The outsiders are believing the word of God, that the king will be born in Bethlehem from the prophets. Meanwhile, the insiders are ignoring it. The non-believers, the magi, they end up being the ones who ultimately preach the good news to Israel. And so we see one group of 
people coming to Christ with worship in their hearts. And we see another coming with murder on their minds. We see people coming to Christ in faith, and they're also coming in rebellion. And so the leaders of the people to whom the promises were given, they don't believe these promises enough to walk the six miles. That's how far away he is, six miles, to receive the promises that lie present and breathing in the child, Jesus. They were ignoring God's signs and God's word, but the outsiders are embracing it wholeheartedly. In fact, the story shows us and firms us up for us that God can be revealed both in creation and through the word. Psalm 19, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So for the Magi and for us, God's revelation in creation, it, it both raises the questions and it begins that quest, that journey, that star trek. You might know some folks like this or maybe you had that experience you you i know someone something greater than me is out there i see it in the stars or the sunset or the mountain i see or i i feel something what is it? and it starts those it gets those questions churning in our minds it takes us on that quest on that journey it's the longing of the heart and the soul and the mind to know. And it's ultimately God's revelation in Jesus that satisfies those questions. Scriptural, that those, that what we see in creation, what I just mentioned, the sun, the moon, the stars, the sunsets, they get us halfway right? They get us asking the questions, but it's the revelation we find in the Word of God that has the power to bring us home. Home to Jesus Christ. And God is the author of both types of these revelations, and God uses both to lead us to the one that we truly are after, to Jesus. You see, the stars bring us to Jerusalem. That star brings us to Jerusalem, but it's the child who brings us to Bethlehem. Creation can bring us to the church, but it's the word of God that brings us to Jesus. You see, it wasn't just the Old Testament expectation being fulfilled in this king. It was all of creation and all peoples who were awaiting the world king. This Messiah would bring peace to the whole world, not just the Jewish nation. And this Magi, they needed to know where do we find the world king. So they set off to Bethlehem and they find him thanks to God's revelation. And once again, this time, the star shined right over the place where Mary's child was. And they were overjoyed. And perhaps without even knowing it, the Magi were in a Star Trek that would take them to what, rather, who, who they had been searching for all of their lives. Friends, if the Magi are seeking Christ, it's because God's grace was seeking the Magi. Amen? It's no accident that these folks are the first to worship Jesus. God put this in motion. In fact, the people that were the Jews would see as enemies of their faith are the ones who recognize this reality. That's what makes this story even more believable, that the unlikely characters are the ones worshiping Jesus. It's absolutely upside down <laughs> that they would be the ones. It should be the insiders, right? It should be the church going folk, the believers, the people of faith who fall down in Worship. That Greek word here is proskinesis, worship. Matthew uses it 10 times in his gospel to refer to worship, 
to the acknowledgement of the divine, much more than just, oh, I'm paying homage or honor. The faith of the Magi is astounding. J.C. Ryle puts it like this. They saw nothing but a newborn infant, helpless and weak and needing a mother's care like any one of us. And yet when they saw this infant, they believed that they saw the divine savior of the world. They fell down and worshiped him. We read of no greater faith than this in the whole volume of the Bible. Wow, <laughs> that's of the magi, of the foreigners, of the outsiders. And not only do they worship him, but then they open their treasure boxes, right? And they present him with gifts. Uh, a better word here might be they offered their gifts. And this expression offered was frequently used in the Old Testament for sacrifice. For sacrifices, right? Of offerings presented to God. There's no doubt that we are to understand the presentation of these gifts by the Magi as a religious offering. The gifts they present are meant for kings, rulers, and even gods. You see, when people are drawn to find and worship God in Jesus, they also find themselves wanting to bring their finest things, their finest resources, an offering. In fact, Christmas gift giving finds its origins here with the Magi. God is the first gift giver, and the Magi are the first human gift givers, because once seeing the true king, the ultimate ruler, giving of ourselves is the only response we have. Give God your, the, the glory that God deserves. Give God our whole selves. But then after worship and gifts are offered, now the Magi have to did you catch it? They got to leave by another way. <laughs> After they've encountered this Jesus, after they've given everything that they have right there, offered him a religious offering, they got to go by another way. Why? <laughs> you almost want to capitalize way in this text because their lives have been changed. They're different people now. They're different now that they've encountered Jesus Christ, the King, and we too. When we encounter Jesus, we leave changed. We can't leave unchanged <laughs> because encountering the real and true Jesus means that our lives are different. It means a new reality, not only with God, not a personal reality, but a reality change with others too. So while there is much joy and warmth in this text, there's also that looming threat, right? The death of a king. So even when we look at the story of the Magi, we see the shadow of the cross falling on this story, the story of Jesus. From the start, we see people want to end him. And so the arrival of Jesus is not all warm and cozy. It's into a world of pain and injustice and at a time when a savior was needed. A time for some light to shine in the darkness. A time when we need Emmanuel. We need God with us in the middle of it all. So this is interestingly depicted in the painting on the slide here. Fitz Conrad, he, it's his adoration of the Magi. Here the visit of the Magi come to the baby king, but you see it's that broken buildings. Not in Leonardo da Vinci, right? It's not in the stable. His depiction of the, mag, the adoration of the Magi is even more dire. In his, it's, uh, people are fighting. There's conflict. There's horsemen on, on uh, there's uh, soldiers on horseback fighting each other. People are arguing and there's baby Jesus, Mary in the middle. And all that to say, and that was 15th century. All that to say that God chooses to meet us in the midst of chaos, in the midst of decay, in the midst of brokenness. Amen? The Magi are the first to call Jesus the King of the Jews. 
But it's a title that rings in our ears, doesn't it? Because we know all too well that it will be spoken, that it will be engraved on that crown. When another threatened king, Pilate wants him dead and succeeds. <laughs> and so it's the soldiers that are next set of Gentiles, outsiders, foreigners, to call him king of the Jews. But they do not offer him gifts of honor. Rather, they offer him a crown of thorns and the throne of a cross. And there will be no bright star that day, only darkness, and all for the sake of God's people. For you, for me, for the Magi, and even for Herod. You know, when we look at this story and we think, well, Herod is so evil. <laughs> I mean, he's got some problems, right? He's the villain in this piece. But frankly, he's not. He's every person. He's every man. He's every woman. He just reveals that the natural human reaction to the kingship, the rule of Jesus in our lives. Rebellion, right? That's what we experience deep down inside. We're tempted to doubt, to hate, to even resist this real king, this grace that's coming to us. And so while the Magi may represent who we are externally, that aliens to Christ longing for a savior, Herod might represent who we are internally, rebels. <laughs> and Herod gets a chance to respond to Christ, and he could make the same Star Trek if he chose to. And so Herod and the Magi are both people in need of saving both foreigners and outsiders, both hearers of God's word, and both invited to the party, <laughs> just like we are. And so it's our response to this invitation, to this offered grace, that will determine which way we leave. Friends, the Magi are an encouragement that God's grace can call us now, no matter how far out or far off we are. And Herod is a warning of what happens when we despise and resist that grace, no matter how far in or far up we are in the church. <laughs> so may we, like the Magi, heed God's revelation. God's revelation in both creation and in God's words. And may we go to Bethlehem in faith. May we meet Jesus, give him our gifts, and go home by another way, changed. Whatever we've been looking for all of our lives, it's found in Jesus, the King of Kings, the one who bled and died and rose again and has ascended into heaven for us. So come friends, Trekkies, <laughs> by whatever route you can, and with the best gifts you can find. Amen. Amen.